Studying this topic might leave your brain feeling marinated in a brine of complex medical jargon, scrambled like an egg and fried in a pan of confusion and seasoned with unfamiliar concepts. It's the perfect recipe for bloodthirsty examiners and the grilling of senior doctors. But take solace, we got you. In this video, we'll delve into the somatosensory system in the simplest way possible, of course. We'll clear any confusion and enhance your understanding of this topic, regardless of your prior knowledge. Get ready for clarity that sticks. Your brain will thank you. To start, though, we need to define the term somatosensory system to create a solid foundation on which we will build as we progress. Raise your hand if you can name the five senses. Sight, hearing, smell, taste, touch, nailed it. But our sensations from a physiological standpoint are divided into two, the special and somatic sensations. The special sensations rely on dedicated sense organs like those for vision, hearing, taste, and smell. The somatic sensations, meanwhile, arise from the intricate network of receptors within our skin, muscles, tendons, and joints. These form the somatosensory system. Now, ever raised your hand and felt it hover in the air while your eyes were closed or blindfolded, or bask in the sun's warmth? How about the touch of a feather, sending goosebumps across your arm? These are what are referred to as somatic sensations. They are of three types. One is mild or light sensations, encompassing fine touch, tactile sensations, spatial awareness, tactile localization, precise discrimination, tactile discrimination, and comfortable temperature perception, 2540 degrees C, they are referred to as epicritic sensations. The second category is crude sensations. These include the blunt pressure of a heavy touch, the searing sting of pain, and temperature extremes far from our comfort zone, above 40 degrees Celsius and below 25 degrees Celsius. These are the protopathic sensations, and they are primitive in nature. The third category is sensations arising from deeper structures beneath the skin and visceral organs. They include sensation of vibration or palesthesia, which is the combination of touch and pressure sensation, kinesthetic sensation or kinesthesia, sensation of position and movements of different parts of the body, and visceral sensations arising from viscera. These are referred to as deep sensation. As you might ask yourself, how are these sensations felt? Or rather, how are these external stimuli received from our environment to the point where we feel them? The simple answer, of course, is receptors. However, there's more to the story. You see, there are different types of receptors for different stimuli, and this forms the first point of the somatosensory pathways, which of course we'll discuss later in the video. So, receptors are of four main types in the somatosensory system. The first are those used to sense for touch. In general, they are referred to as mechanoreceptors. However, there are various subtypes of mechanoreceptors, each attuned to specific stimuli. That is, those sensitive to light touch, the Meissner tactile receptors, those sensitive to pressure, the Merkel tactile discs, those sensitive to skin stretching, the Ruffini corpuscles, and finally those sensitive to vibration, the Pacinian corpuscles. The second type of receptor is one responsible for the conscious perception of one's own body part's position and movement. These are referred to as proprioceptors. There are three types, that is, those that detect when muscles are spread, the muscle spindle receptors, those that detect when tendons are spread, the Golgi tendon organs, and finally those that detect when joints are moved, the joint receptors. Many students get tripped up here, but worry not. We'll take a quick recall of what we've covered so far, then continue from there as we introduce this next confusing subtopic. And as promised, we will clear all the confusion. So, external stimuli like touch, pain, heat, and even limb movement create sensations categorized as epicritic, protopathic, or deep. These sensations are captured by specialized receptors in the skin, joints, and tendons. But how does the brain decode this sensory language? How does it distinguish hot from cold? 
Well, these receptors cleverly translate the stimuli into electrical signals, relayed through a network of nerves that ascend the spinal cord, like messengers before reaching their final destination, the brain's primary somatic sensory cortex. This intricate series of nerve networks form the somatosensory pathways, ascending like highways within the spinal cord. But we'll explore those intricacies in a moment. For now, let's turn our attention to the primary somatic sensory cortex, the brain's command center for interpreting sensory stimuli. Don't worry, the scary appearance belies a fascinating concept. Within the parietal lobe, a crucial region dedicated to perception and sensory interpretation, lies the primary somatosensory cortex. A peek into this region reveals the precise locations where each touch, tingle, and temperature become a conscious experience. Remember those intricate series of nerve networks we mentioned earlier, the ones that form the somatosensory pathways? You might be wondering why they're referred to as a series of networks. Well, it's because they're three distinct groups of neurons working in concert. First are those neurons receiving sensory impulses from receptors and transmitting them to a region in the spinal cord. These neurons are referred to as the first order neurons. Second are those that transmit the sensory impulses from the spinal cord to various subcortical areas below the cerebral cortex, such as the thalamus. They form the ascending tracts of the spinal cord and are referred to as the second order neurons. Finally, we have the third and final group of neurons are those that are located in the subcortical areas and they convey sensory impulses from the subcortical regions to the primary sensory cortex. This group of neurons is referred to as third order neurons. These groups of neurons combine to form tracts and this brings us to our core topic today the ascending tracts of the spinal cord, also known as the somatosensory pathways. Within the spinal cord, two main ascending tracts reign supreme. The spinothalamic tract, additionally called the anterolateral system, and the dorsal column medial lemniscus pathway, DCML, alternatively known as the posterior column medial lemniscus pathway. So, let's dive in and start with the, the spinothalamic tract, or the anterolateral system. The spinothalamic tract, a critical sensory pathway in the nervous system, has two main divisions, the lateral and anterior spinothalamic tracts. And to facilitate our understanding, we'll draw upon earlier studies, which identified that these two divisions relayed two distinctive types of sensations. However, before delving deeper, let's introduce a crucial concept, Neural fiber types. In this tract, two main types of nerve fibers stand out, differentiated by their level of myelination. Firstly, those that transmit rapid, immediate pain sensations elicited primarily by mechanical stimulation and extreme temperatures. These large axon fibers have impressive conduction speeds, zipping impulses along at up to 6 milliseconds. This results in swiftly localized pain messages traversing the lateral spinothalamic tract. These fibers are referred to as the A-delta fibers. Notably, they possess a higher degree of myelination. Secondly, those that transmit slow, aching pain often arise from inflammation, chemical factors, scorching temperatures, and mechanical stimuli. Unlike the sharp, well-defined pain relayed by A-delta fibers, these fibers deliver poorly localized, dull aches. These fibers fall on the other end of the myelination spectrum, exhibiting a lower degree. These fibers are referred to as the C fibers. Before we dive into the individual pathways of the lateral and anterior spinothalamic tracts, let's pause for a moment. Which sensations do you think each relay? The anterior spinothalamic tract relay sensations of crude touch and pressure. An example is a gentle brush of fabric against your skin or the firm press of a fingertip. In contrast, the lateral spinothalamic tract relays sensations of more potent messages of pain and temperature. It's the alarm system for your body. An example is a stubbed toe or a scorching cup of coffee. 
So let's track the anterior spinothalamic tract. External stimuli of crude touch and pressure activate the mechanoreceptors. Receptor activation generates signals that travel along the axons of the first order neurons in the dorsal ganglion, the pseudoanipular neurons. The pseudoanipular neuron, which relay these sensations into the spinal cord, enters through the posterior nerve root of the spinal cord to the chief sensory nucleus of the posterior gray horn. From here, the second order neurons originate after synapsing with the first order neurons. After taking origin, these fibers cross obliquely in the anterior white commissure and enter the anterior white column of the opposite side. Here, the fibers ascend through other segments of the spinal cord and brainstem, that is the medulla, the pons and the midbrain, and reach the thalamus. Note in the medulla. This pathway, the anterior spinothalamic tract, links up with the lateral spinothalamic tract and ascends as one large system, that is why it is referred to as the anterolateral system, or as other books refer to it as the spinal lemniscus. Here, in the thalamus, the second order neurons terminate in a structure called the ventral posterior lateral nucleus, and some fibers terminate in the ventral posterior inferior nucleus. From here, synapsing occurs, and the third order neurons originate and pass through the posterior one-third of the internal capsule, from where it enters, the coronal radiata and sensations are relayed to different regions of the primary somatosensory cortex that we spoke about earlier, where the crude touch and pressure sensations from different areas of the body are interpreted. So now let's track the lateral spinothalamic tract. External stimuli like tissue chemical factors from inflammatory agents such as bradykinin, hot temperatures and mechanical stimuli activate the nociceptors, which stimulate the C-fibers of the pseudoanipular neurons, first order neurons, which relay the sensations from the receptors to the spinal cord where they enter through the posterior gray horn. Immediately, these fibers give ascending branches and descending branches, which go down or up two or three segments. These ascending and descending branches form the tract of Lisauer. We shall discuss the clinical implications of this tract later. The continuous branch of the C-fiber continues through the rex lamini and synapses in specific points, which are the substantia gelatinosa of Rolando and the marginal nucleus. Axons originating from this region form the second order neurons and cross via anterior white commissure to the opposite side and reach the lateral column of the same segment. Let's pause for a minute, we shall get back to this. Cold temperatures activate the nociceptors that generate impulses relayed via the A-delta fibers, which as you recall, we said are fast and can localize the sensation. pseudo unipolar neurons First order neurons relay the sensations from the receptors to the spinal cord where they enter through the posterior gray horn and as the C fibers, it immediately gives ascending branches and descending branches, they go down or up two or three. These ascending and descending branches form the tract of Lissauer. As we said earlier, we shall discuss the clinical implications later in the video. The continuous branch of the A-delta fibers continues through the rex lamini and synapses in specific points, the marginal nucleus and the reticular nucleus. Axons originating from this region form the second order neurons and cross via anterior white commissure to the opposite side and reach the lateral column of the same segment. After crossing, the lateral column fibers, the C fibers, and the A delta fibers form the lateral spinothalamic tract. 
From this point, it ascends various segments of the spinal cord, where in the medulla, it links up with the anterior spinothalamic tract and ascends as one large system. That is why it is referred to as the anterolateral system, or as other books refer to it as the spinal lemniscus pathway, which ascend to the thalamus. The A-delta fibres, which remember is a part of the lateral spinothalamic tract, ascend through the segments. It gives a few collaterals to the reticular formation, but most of them ascend to a nucleus in the thalamus, known as the ventral posterior lateral, and some can go with ventral posterior inferior, where it synapses with the third order neurons which relay the sensations to the primary sensory cortex in the parietal lobe via the coronary radiata and through the posterior one-third of the internal capsule. So, this is where it gets interesting for the C-fibers, which remember is also part of the lateral spinothalamic tract. About 15% of its fibers make it to the thalamus, and the rest, 85% terminate in the reticular formation. The 15% that makes it to the thalamus, the second-order neurons, synapse, at the intralaminar nucleus in the thalamus to form the third order neurons that relay the sensations to the following structures. 1. Is those structures that interpret the pain from different parts of the body, the primary somatosensory cortex 2, the part of the cortex that is associated with the emotional aspect of pain, the cingulate gyrus 3rd, the part deep into the temporal lobe that is also associated with the emotional aspect of the pain, is referred to as the anterior insular cortex. So, as we finish up discussing the spinothalamic tract, let's tie up some loose ends. Do you remember that we said that the tract of Lissauer has some clinical application? So, this is where we discuss this. The lesions of the spinothalamic tract. As the spinothalamic tract crosses, or if you like decussates, at the level of the spinal nerve, if a lesion occurs in the brainstem or higher, the patient presents with loss of pain perception, crude touch, and temperature sensation contralateral to the lesion. However, with spinal cord hemisections, the loss of fine touch and proprioception is ipsilateral, while that of pain perception and temperature sensation is contralateral, and this phenomenon is commonly seen in the... Now let's discuss the dorsal column medial lemniscus pathway. DCML. So, the dorsal column medial lemniscus pathway is part of the ascending tracts of the spinal cord. It mainly relays sensations of fine and discriminative touch, pressure, stretch and vibration, and the most important of all is the proprioception sensation. So now let's track the dorsal column medial lemniscus pathway. External stimuli of fine discriminative touch pressure, stretch and vibrations, and proprioception trigger their receptors, triggering the generation of nerve impulses in the pseudo-unipolar first-order neurons. Note, by the way, this tract has very fast nerve fibres. Before we continue, let's divide the spinal cord into two sections. That is the spinal cord above T6 and those below the T6. First order neurons, the pseudo neurons from the regions below T6, enter the spinal cord through the posterior grey horn and travel towards the dorsal white column, ipsilaterally, without, crossing or synapsing. It then ascends more medially to this dorsal median sulcus as the fasciculus gracilis within the dorsal column. Axon fibres of the fasciculus gracilis ascend the rest of the spinal cord ipsilaterally. The axon fibres of the first-order neurons of fasciculus gracilis synapse with those of the second-order neurons in the nucleus gracilis within the medulla ipsilaterally. For the first-order neurons, the pseudo-unipolar neurons from the regions above the T6 enter the spinal cord through the posterior grey horn and project in towards the dorsal white column ipsilaterally without crossing or synapsing. It then ascends more lateral to the dorsal median sulcus and the fasciculus gracilis and ascends as the fasciculus cuneatus within the dorsal column. Axon fibres of the fasciculus cuneatus ascends the rest of the spinal cord ipsilaterally. 
the axon fibers of the first order neurons, a fasciculus cuneatus, synapse with those of the second order neurons in the nucleus cuneatus within the medulla ipsilaterally. Second order neurons of ipsilateral fasciculus cuneatus and fasciculus gracilis form connections, bundle up, and cross contralaterally in the dorsal part of the medulla in an area called the internal actuate fibers. This newly formed bundle from the connections of fasciculus cuneatus and fasciculus gracilis is called the medial lemniscus. The medial lemniscus ascends through the brainstem and into the thalamus where it synapses with the third order neurons at the ventral posterior lateral nucleus. The axons of the third order neurons pass through the posterior one third of the internal capsule and then come up through the coronal radiata into the primary somatosensory cortex where the somatosensory sensations are interpreted. Thank you for tuning in to our video. I hope this discussion has cleared your confusion. Join us next time as we discuss synapses and neurotransmitters. Hit that like button, join the conversation in the comments, and most importantly, subscribe. Until next time, take care and have a nice time.